I have a friend named Daniel, who years and years ago when the PS3 was still fairly new, he bought a Silent Hill 1 on the PSN as a PlayStation 1 classic, and he told me this was the scariest game ever made, the greatest horror game ever made, and that he would have the balls to finish it. He would be able to get through it. Funny enough, he, he didn't get through it. He couldn't even get past the school. And, and I looked at that and I told him, you know what? I bet I could beat this game. I bet I can finish this game. So the following day I bought the game myself and I started playing it. And that would be the very first time I ever played a Silent Hill game all those years ago. And it became a series I loved so much that I immediately, as soon as I could, bought every other game in the series, at least the, the first three sequels to it. It was around this time that I started looking into the series, like looking it up online, and I found out that only like the first four games were developed by Team Silent, the original developers, and then I played Origins and I didn't really like it, and I looked at Homecoming and I didn't think it looked very good, but this was also around the same time Shattered Memories just came out, and I was hearing lots of great things about it, so I played it and I enjoyed it quite a bit. And then came the first time in my life where I was actually looking forward to the new Silent Hill game. I was excited for the new Silent Hill game. And that new Silent Hill game was Silent Hill Downpour. I was also a cautious Sonic fan at the time, reading reviews to make sure the new game didn't suck before I actually bought it. So I knew not to just buy it out of naivety at launch. I guess you could say I was more so looking forward to seeing how it would actually turn out. Based on what I saw in the trailers, it was the modern Silent Hill game I wanted to happen. It looked promising, with genuinely interesting concepts and gameplay elements. But when the game launched, it gathered nothing but hate from critics and fans alike. Websites reported that the game was a glitchy and unplayable mess, and that it was boring. Some even called it the worst Silent Hill game ever made. Based on these observations, I got disappointed and I decided not to buy it. I had better things to do with my money than pay $50 for a bad Silent Hill game. But then, years passed and the price quickly went down. It was only about one year later that I saw it sitting on the game shelf for $10. So I thought to myself, what the hell, it's 10 bucks, how bad could it really be? I was curious and I wanted to play it for myself to see what the game was really like. So I brought it home, I put it in, and I played it. And I'll tell you right now, I did not get what I expected. Silent Hill Downpour was the very first game ever developed by Vatra Games. The only other game they made was that terrible Russian attack reboot for Xbox Live Arcade. Remember that game? I feel as if they're almost hinting at it with the reference to it in Silent Hill Shattered Memories. Only a single year after developing Downpour, they filed for bankruptcy. They've been completely silent ever since. Silent Hill Downpour launched in 2012 for the Xbox 360 and the PS3. It was the very first Silent Hill game ever to run on the Unreal Engine, which apparently the developers had no idea how to use. This is made evident by every review ever published for the game mentioning that the game runs like dick on it. Downpour was critically panned for its awful performance, including a consistently terrible frame rate, freezing, crashing, and frequent game-breaking glitches. Months later, they ended up releasing patches that made playing the game much more stable. Lucky for me, this is the state in which I played it. So, here it is, the worst Silent Hill game ever made, at least as of 2012 anyway. It's likely that the core of the game's problems no longer exists now that the game's been patched, so I think now that it's years later, it's high time someone takes a much more fair look at this game. So, let's begin. This is Silent Hill Downpour. I guess it's high time we start a new file and check out the game. I have to be seeing things. Downpour has a separate puzzle difficulty? And it's not a joke either, the puzzles are actually heavily affected by it in perfectly fair ways. Oh my god, I I can't believe it. A modern Silent Hill game that does in fact have a separate puzzle difficulty. I think I love this game already. The game's intro features Murphy Pendleton, a prisoner at Ryle State Prison, being escorted by a shifty jail guard, Officer Sewell, to a shower room. Alright Murphy, it's all set. Make it quick, huh? Follow me. Sewell's arranging a meeting between Murphy and a sequestered prisoner. Pulling some strings at security, Sewell arranges a situation in which Murphy can murder this man. It's unknown why Murphy wants to kill this guy, but in doing so, we also learn how the basic combat controls. This way we get a pretty seamless tutorial without it really being pushy in any way, and I really like that. Killing this guy just feels... 
wrong. He's this defenseless and disgusting looking human being that we're stabbing and beating to a pulp. It's unnerving and I almost felt sorry for the guy, especially since I had no idea why we were doing this to him. After an unknown amount of time passes, Murphy is woken up to be transferred to another prison. Officer Sewell escorts Murphy out of the prison to the bus, but this time there's a weird tension between the characters. You gonna miss us? Not even a little. The setting and tone is really powerful as you're hammered by the shouting of other prisoners as you exit the building. I'll see you on the outside. I can't wait until I'm out of here. <laughs> Don't even come back. Yeah, keep walking, punk. At the bus, Murphy meets with Officer Anne, who goes out of her way to stop Murphy. Pendleton. Get on the bus. She seems to display disgust specifically towards Murphy, and we don't know why. During the bus ride, unforeseen circumstances occur, and the bus crashes in, you guessed it, Silent Hill. I really, really, really love this opening. It's a lot more cinematic than previous Silent Hill games, but it sets the mood so fantastically. It raises a lot of questions that I'd love to see answered too, like why does Murphy hate Sewell after he pulled him that favor? And why'd Murphy want to kill that guy in the first place? And what's Anne's problem? These questions all become answered throughout the game's story. As Murphy journeys through Silent Hill, we gradually uncover why exactly he was in jail. But not only that, but we explore the flawed personalities and motives of all of these characters. This is easily the most original Silent Hill story since Silent Hill 4. The controls are really similar to Shattered Memories, minus the flashlight thing with the Wii Remote. In fact, I'm pretty sure they just tried to recreate Shattered Memories control scheme in the Unreal Engine. You've got the Run button and the View Zoom button and the Look Back Over Your Shoulder button, which is actually a lot more useful in this game than it was in Shattered Memories, and you know that over the shoulder camera that so many modern games tend to have nowadays. The gameplay itself is a lot closer to that of Homecomings. You've got a mashup of exploration, puzzle solving, and combat all done with the modern camera controls. The combat takes notes from Homecomings errors and dulls it down quite a bit. There's no longer a dodge button, there's no longer attack combos, and there's no longer a need to parry your enemies. Instead, we have one attack button and one block button. It's a lot like Silent Hill 3's combat. The combat is kind of clunky, but not in a frustrating way that Homecomings was. It's a lot easier to figure out when enemies are going to attack, making it actually possible to avoid getting hit or wasting lots of health. Being able to block is definitely what saves it this time around. Murphy can shrug off almost any attack so long as he's blocking. Though blocking will only achieve this if you're carrying a weapon. Blocking unarmed won't prevent all damage and will also enter a short stun period. Now the stun locking issue from Homecoming is completely gone. This means enemies will not be able to effortlessly plow through like all of your health just because you got unlucky with a wall behind you. I think the best part of the block button is that it interrupts your current animation, so say if you're in mid-swing with your weapon, it's still not too late to block. You can just push the button, Murphy will stop swinging his weapon and enter a blocking pose. It takes a little bit getting used to, but the combat is not hard to get good at. It definitely doesn't come anywhere close to achieving the same level of survival horror gameplay that the series was originally known for, but at least it's not a frustrating mess like Homecoming was. I rarely have trouble battling enemies so long as I try to be careful. The weapons in the game take a more Silent Hill Origins approach. Just like Origins, the weapons are everywhere and they'll break often too. Though this time, you can only carry one weapon at a time. This means you won't have an arsenal to look at every time one breaks. If your weapon falls apart, you're just going to have to grab the closest thing you can get your hands on. You're also able to throw the weapons with the right shoulder button. This is great to use if you know your weapons are going to break soon or you happen to be near a pile of bricks. Since, you know, bricks are a lot better to be thrown than used as a club. There's really not a lot of variety in enemy types. I think there's about, like, five enemies and their designs are definitely short of creativity. They just look like people. Sure, they look like they've been run over by a truck, but other than that, they're extremely bland. And if one thing's for sure, they're definitely not scary looking either. <laughs> the only enemy I find interesting in any sort of way are the dolls. A ghost you can only see with a UV light will attack you, and the only way to stop them is to find the physical mannequin they're being emit from and destroy it. It's cool, but it's literally the only time they decided to get a little bit creative with one of the enemy types. Other than these guys, which love to cling to the ceiling, that can be a little frustrating. Or you can just throw shit at them. 
Also like homecoming, many weapons serve a secondary function that'll open up a pathway. Wrenches and pipes can smash off padlocks, axes and crowbars can chop through boarded up door, and ladder hooks can you know, unhook ladders. Now I said this concept might have worked in Homecoming if you didn't have access to all of the weapons at all times. Downpour took this concept and actually made it work. Now it's not a matter of just switching to whatever weapon that you need to unlock the door, now it's a matter of I might not even be able to unlock the door. Let's take a look around. Is there an axe over there? Is there a crowbar lying around anywhere here? Maybe if I explore a little bit, I'll find what I'm looking for. Maybe not, though. You might want to hang on to that ladder hook instead of breaking it over someone's head because you'd think you might find a secret area where you might want to save that axe from breaking because there might be a boarded up door coming up. Sometimes it's as simple as looking around the area. You'll often find what you need, and I feel that really adds to the sense of exploration. I wasn't expecting this. It took two flawed systems from two different Silent Hill games, combined them, and made them work surprisingly well. I really like this concept, it's a lot of fun always searching for the weapons you need to survive. It adds an element of improvisation to the gameplay that hasn't previously been explored in the Silent Hill title. In addition to carrying only one weapon, you can also pocket a single gun. I like that that also kinda makes sense, I mean you can't fit 17 crowbars into your pocket, but you could fit a gun. There really isn't much variety as far as the guns go. There's a nail gun, which is a pretty cool weapon. Again, it feels like something you'd use in a survival game, a regular object being used upon improvisation. There's also a pistol and a shotgun. Though I never found the shotgun until the last level, so I don't know where it is in the main game. I'm sure you can find it somewhere. There's a lot of different locations you can find these, because it's not guaranteed that you'll actually explore all of these places. There's also many different locations you can find objects like the flashlight and even the radio. So say you missed finding the flashlight here, you can find it here instead. I like this, because it makes the world a lot more believable. I mean, it's not like there's only one flashlight in all of Silent Hill. There's bound to be a handful lying around, and if you happen to pick one up, right on. Though this does create problems. Since they're all missable and optional, you might just completely miss one. You probably won't have an issue finding the flashlight, but on my first playthrough of the game, I thought there wasn't a radio because I completely missed every instance in which you can pick it up. Look right here, the first spot you can find it. It's so easy to miss. Again, there are other spots you can pick it up too, but they're all equally as easy to miss. In Downpour, when an enemy is nearby, you'll hear police chatter come out of the radio. It's a cool little tweak to the iconic sound effect that matches the character mode motif of, you know, being a prisoner. The puzzles in Downpour are also pretty consistent with their quality. Imagine the ones I liked in Homecoming, and simply elaborate on them. There's no wire puzzles or moving block puzzles, well, with the exception of one really easy one that can be done in less than a minute. Instead, we've got a nice variety of examining our environments and interpreting as the solution. Like watching slides on a projector to figure out a code, or returning a box full of stolen stuff to locations in an apartment building based on only the sounds of the past you hear in the rooms they were stolen from. This one here is part of a side quest that you can unlock a new costume from. I gotta say, Murphy looks pretty slick in a blue hoodie. And of course, the puzzles are all pretty different on the hard puzzle difficulty. Downpour definitely gets puzzles right. It does it a lot better than Homecoming or Origins could ever hope to. Some of the puzzles involve using a UV light to search for footprints and other stains on the environment. You'll stumble across a flashlight that doubles as a UV light in the library. There's some really cool puzzles using it, but it's pretty short-lived and I wish they used it more often throughout the game. The game overall is structured fairly similar to Homecoming, which I'm okay with. You explore each place with exploring the town in between, it's just that the town is a lot more open this time around and that creates opportunity for exploration. Exploring the town is often a lot of fun and very rewarding too. You're even able to find side quests that will reward you with a better weapon or a health pickup. These can range from simply collecting things like paintings or mementos to killing a bunch of monsters at a bank to unlock the vault. You can also find some easter eggs by exploring the town. This one here is my favorite. On the northern end of Lansdale Avenue, look for a ladder. You'll need a ladder hook to get it down. Climbing up here and through the window will land you in an exact replica of room 302 from Silent Hill 4. That is so rad. In here, there's also a gun and some health pickups, but who cares? You're in the room. Another Easter egg I stumbled upon is a portrait of the Shepherd family house from Silent Hill Homecoming. I don't know why you'd want to reference that game. I think at this point we're trying to forget about it, aren't we? 
Now, I don't know if this would even be considered an Easter egg, but here's a really cool detail that really messed me up. In the monastery, there's a tire hanging from a rope. If you turn the camera away and look back, it replaces itself with a person being hanged. Every time you look away, it changes off screen again. The first time I noticed this, I thought it was going crazy or something. I saw a tire hanging there when I swore that it was a dead body before. I had no idea that it was just the game playing tricks on me. This is a detail that's really cool and very easy to appreciate. It makes me wish the game did things like this to mess with you a lot more often. One of the side quests involves finding a bunch of items for a hobo. You'll need to at least find him a chocolate bar to gain access to the subways, which acts as the game's fast traveling system. If you ever plan on doing all of the side quests, do not forget to do this or you're gonna have a really bad time backtracking all the way to previous parts of town. It seems a little too tucked away in a random corner without the game telling you it even exists. On that note, I also wish you ran faster too. The running speed's better than it wasn't homecoming, but it still just isn't enough. You run faster when monsters are around, I don't know why you can't have that running speed all the time. At least running controls a lot better than it did in homecoming. You won't have to turn the camera around all the way if you want to bolt in the opposite direction. Murphy will run towards the camera just as fast as away, so that's a lot better this time too. And like any other Silent Hill game, there's a fair share of the other world segments. While they served as an extension of the exploration in past games, Downport's other worlds are a lot more linear. It's more like a roller coaster of madness, sometimes filled with action and other times with some pretty decent puzzles. The chase sequences from Shattered Memories Return Gee, that's great. Though they're not as bad as they were in Shattered Memories. The levels are a lot more linear and less convoluted, and it'll take you a lot less time to get through them. Once again, you're also able to knock over objects to slow down what's chasing you, but I can't help but to feel that it slows you down a lot more than it does your pursuer, so I kind of stop bothering to do it. I also just don't get what it is you're running from. It's like a red void black hole thing. I understand that the element of fear is stronger when you don't know what's chasing you, but this is not how you do it. I mean, like, I can see, I can visually see that it's a red black hole sucky thing I'm running from. That's, that's not what they meant when they said it's scarier when you don't know what it is you're running from. The other world will also occasionally feature this dumb slide segment. Can someone explain to me why so many survival games have this? Tomb Raider has it? The Evil Within has it? I, I don't get it. Is this a survival horror game or am I at a theme park? Yet another thing it does better than Homecoming is the way the game plays with the character motif. Instead of having hilariously bad and blatant symbolism, it designs a lot of the levels around it. Many of the other world segments have elements of bars and jail cell looking scenery subtly worked into the level design. I like it. Now, the game's presentation is really hit and miss. Character models sometimes look good, and the frame rate seems like it's constantly struggling to stay at 30 FPS. The frame rate is constantly dipping and stuttering. Again, you can tell the developers had no idea how to use the Unreal Engine. And this is after the patch, mind you. Before the patch, the game was hardly in a playable state. Well, I guess that does explain this. And this. And this and this and this and this. Is it really this hard to make your game work at launch? I strongly feel this game would not have been this poorly received when it came out if the game ran the way it does now when it first launched. All they needed to do was delay the game for maybe two months and they could have fixed this. But you know, that's Konami for ya. They just love to put out games before they're actually done. Performance issues aside, a lot of the environments look really nice. It definitely has that genuine feel given off from urban exploration of decrepit buildings. The lighting effects are solid too with some really nice looking light shafts. But then again, the game also has some really bad looking light shafts too. Again, sometimes the game looks beautiful. Other times, it doesn't at all. This is also the first Silent Hill game not to be scored by Akira Yamaoka. I guess he finally realized it's best if he jumped the Konami ship while he still could. Instead, we have composer Daniel Licht. Well, it definitely has a little bit of a different vibe to it, but the music in Downpour still does a job really well. But music and the occasional pretty environment aside, the presentation is definitely Downpour's weakest aspect. But don't let that keep you from playing the game. 
It may be falling apart, but there's still a lot of brilliance to be found here. Throughout the game, you'll pick up a lot of documents of crime scene evidence relating back to Murphy's past, and we get an early idea of just what the hell he was doing in jail. Why are you doing this to me? Like the classic series, there's a lot of pickups you can find that contain little backstories that enhance the game world's personality. Though sometimes the game just assumes you actually read all of them instead of skipping it like I often do. I mean, let's be real, you're not gonna read every single newspaper scrap you pick up in Silent Hill. In The Devil's Pit, you meet a character named JP who's contemplating suicide. He was responsible for an accident at an attraction in the park which resulted in a couple of children deaths. But the cutscene that addresses that just assumes you already know from reading all of the notes. Yeah, it's mandatory that you pick up the notes, but that doesn't mean I actually read them. Tying optional literature to mandatory plot is dumb. Here you're also given a moral choice. Similar to Homecoming, there is a handful of moral choices that'll affect the ending you get. They completely cheesed it this time around. There's no choice, only the illusion of choice. You want to save Anne from falling off the cliff? Whether you choose yes or no, she still falls off. The same goes for JP. It doesn't matter which option you pick, the outcome is the same. It's just a cheap and effortless way to direct you into getting a different ending cutscene without actually having to work through a constantly evolving plot. They do this so they don't have to remake certain cutscenes or change the way the plot is in the middle of the game. It only changes the way the plot is at the very end. Outside of that though, the plot is surprisingly pretty dang good. It's a much more straight to the point and cinematic approach unlike Shattered Memories which was very smart with its symbolism. Downpour is the first real original Silent Hill game not made by Team Silent. It's the first game not to have any characters from any previous games. Origins and Shattered Memories built off of Silent Hill 1 using their characters, and then Homecoming shamelessly used Silent Hill 2 by grabbing their nurses and Pyramid Head. But Downpour is 100% original. In the way I see it, it's sort of a win-win situation, right? The only thing connecting it is the only thing that should connect it, the town of Silent Hill, which serves its rightful purpose of teaching the characters a lesson. And more than just the main character too. Like Silent Hill 2, there's other characters that learn and change. And again, like Silent Hill 2, there's the ones that don't and end up being punished or killed because of it. This is what Silent Hill should be about, using the town as a vessel to explore a flawed character. And it's crazy it took this long for someone to try and make one this way. I like that some of the characters try to comprehend Silent Hill. That's not gonna work. This place, it, it does strange shit to reality, man. It's like, there's rules you gotta, gotta follow, you know what I mean? But to everyone, it remains this bizarre, nonsensical manifestation of their own fears they couldn't possibly understand. I mean, whether they learned their lesson or not, They'll never understand why Silent Hill is the way it is. It's a permanent mystery that doesn't get explained, and we don't need it to be explained. The game isn't about explaining why Silent Hill is the way it is. It's about using Silent Hill to explore the character. You know what? I think this is why I really hated the Silent Hill movie. It goes so far out of its way to try and explain why Silent Hill is a spooky town instead of trying to use the town. On that note, do you remember how Origins had a stupid pyramid head equivalent just for the sake of having one? Or how Homecoming literally just had pyramid head just because he's pyramid head? This game does have a pyramid head equivalent, but it actually serves a purpose. Okay, at face value, you might not think so. Here we have the Boogeyman, which upon initial inspection seems like a dumb and cliche attempt at making a juvenile baddie a horror villain, but I would argue that it's actually a lot smarter than that. The Boogeyman represents a simple evil, an evil that's only evil because you don't understand it. In this incarnation of Silent Hill, each person has their own Boogeyman. To Murphy, it's Patrick, the guy he killed in the jail. The man he wanted revenge on, but to Anne, it's Murphy. Murphy's the boogeyman. Because what's the boogeyman to a kid? The boogeyman is just this thing that scares them because they don't realize that it's harmless. And that's exactly how Anne sees Murphy. She thinks he's this pure evil person that ruined her life based on misunderstanding. She doesn't realize that he's actually harmless. This ties into another recurring monster called the Wheelman. I'd say the Boogeyman is the Pyramid Head, as the Wheelman is the Valtiel from Silent Hill 3. He's this mysterious, disgusting-looking being constantly watching over you. 
The first time you see him, he's staring at you from a window before quickly disappearing. The second time you see him, it's on a video feed in the background that you might not even notice. It's that subtle. The Wheelman's design was heavily inspired by a British experimental short film by Chris Cunningham called Rubber Johnny. It's on YouTube. Look it up if you don't plan on sleeping that night. I'm warning you now. It's freaky as hell. The Wheelman's design is so visually upsetting. And that's exactly what it's supposed to be. It represents someone that you don't even want to look at, someone who's been a victim of something that ruined their life. We are getting into spoiler territory, so if you haven't played the game and you don't know the game's plot or the, how the game ends yet, I highly recommend you skip to this point in time right here. You can just click right here and it'll skip all the spoilers. I recommend doing this because, like Shattered Memories, I truly believe this game has a fantastic plot. So... You good? You good? Alright, let's go. The big picture looks like this. Patrick Napier, a registered sex offender. The guy we killed at the very beginning of the game. He lured Charlie, Murphy's son, into his truck, put him in a bag, and tossed him into the lake, drowning him. And of course, he goes to jail for this. This leaves Murphy's life in shambles, his son's dead, his wife leaves him, blaming him for it. This man wants revenge. He steals a police cruiser to get himself landed in jail so he can kill the guy. He made a deal with Sewell, a corrupt police officer, to arrange the killing. However, Sewell made Murphy promise him that he'd owe him a favor. Simply kill someone else, someone who deserves it. In the meantime, Murphy also makes friends with another officer, Officer Coldridge, who was fighting hand over fist to get Murphy's papers all in order to get his innocent ass out of jail. Coldridge doesn't know why Murphy's even in here. He feels for him and he wants to help him get out. He doesn't deserve to be here. What the hell are you doing in here anyway, Murphy? You're, you're not like these guys. Later on, when Murphy shows up to kill the guy Sewell wants dead, it turns out to be Coldridge. This isn't what I agreed to. What are you talking about? Ag agreed to what? After refusing to do it, Sewell kills Coldridge himself and frames Murphy. This is what gets him transferred to another prison. So Officer Anne turns out to be Coldridge's daughter, who believes that Murphy is the one that killed her father. She pulled strings to get Murphy sent specifically to the jail that she works at so she could get revenge on him. Coldridge didn't die right away though. He was a living vegetable and suffering, disgusting human being being confined to a wheelchair hooked up to tubes. Anne watched him suffer like this until he slowly passed away. Obviously, the wheelman represents Coldridge in his vegetated state. Him constantly watching over Murphy is his guilt looming over him, reminding him of what he's responsible for. His own selfish lust for revenge is what caused the suffering of another human being. And this is made worse by what Anne sees him as, a boogeyman. An evil that is mislabeled onto someone that doesn't deserve it. This is a plot I thoroughly enjoyed. All of this is uncovered throughout the game with excellent pacing. Downpour's plot is what I would consider nothing short of fantastic. Of course, with the moral choices you can make, there's a slew of different endings. This time it goes to Silent Hill, one route of having a really bad ending where Murphy is executed for his crimes. I'll see you in hell, cupcake. A bad ending where Murphy goes back to jail, a good ending where Murphy and Anne come to terms, and a really good ending which is pretty much the good ending but it wraps everything up a little bit more nicely in a more pleasant and satisfying way. Now I don't like that to achieve the best ending, in addition to making the positive moral choices you also have to keep your monster kill count to a minimum. This isn't always easy to do and it's not something I think is very fair. It's also not something I would know if I didn't look it up, so that's dumb. One thing I I think it's cool though is that there's another ending that can be achieved by letting Anne kill you in the final fight. This one lands Anne in prison with Murphy as a police officer escorting her out. It's a really interesting way to punish the character for failing to learn the lesson Silent Hill tried to teach her. And that being elaborated to the point of being an actual ending to the game is something I find really, really cool. And once again, the moment you've all been waiting for, there is a joke ending. It's not a UFO ending, but it's still pretty damn good. There's a side quest called Digging Up the Past you can do on a second playthrough where you dig up the mementos from various Silent Hill games. Beating the game after completing this will reward you with a surprise party for Murphy, featuring the cast of all previous Silent Hill games topped off with Pyramid Head, who cuts the cake. And the table. Now, there is one fatal flaw Downpour does suffer from, and it's the exact same flaw the previous three games had. The game just isn't scary. 
Downpour setting and mood create an awesome tone of mysterious exploration, but it falls completely short on creating anything creepy. These developers really needed to take a long, open-eyed playthrough of the original four games and tried to understand why they were scary. Not just on a cosmetic level, but also on a mechanic level. The use of darkness and anticipation, madness and intrusion on your safe places. Games are a medium that can create a level of fear that movies just can't, and the developers fail to take advantage of that. If the horror in your game only comes from the visuals and the music, you're not taking advantage of the medium you're being given. You can do all that in a movie, but only a video game can have you push yourself forward and uncover what's next. Each of the four games in question all fail to do this. So, in conclusion, Silent Hill Downpour really is not that bad. It runs like dick sometimes, and it's another not scary Silent Hill game, but if you can get past that, there's a surprisingly decent game here. It's got a fantastic plot, good puzzles, fun exploration, and a combat system I actually don't hate. I'm gonna have to give Silent Hill Downpour a thumbs up, no, two thumbs ups. Two thumbs ups. I really like this game. Last year I recommended checking out Silent Hill 4 if you haven't yet because it's definitely the black sheep of the bunch, but also the hidden gem. This year I'm recommending Silent Hill Downpour. It is easily the most underrated Silent Hill game ever made and a hidden gem for sure. At this point, it's really not that hard to find a copy of the game for less than $15, so by all means, go out there, find a copy of the game, bring it home, and play it. It just might surprise you. Silent Hill Downpour is my favorite Silent Hill game that came out after Silent Hill 4. Oops. So I guess that's it for the Silent Hill Marathon this year. I know there is still a little bit of ground to cover, there's that obscure PSP promotional disc, there's that god-awful Vita game, Book of Memories, and then, of course, there's the brilliance that is PT, which has been talked about to death at this point, and I don't really feel the need to cover it, at least not this year after, you know, it's been so recent. But who knows, maybe next year we'll tackle those games, maybe next year we'll tackle the next series that Team Silent went to work on. I, I don't know, I'll figure that out when next year is now. So in the meantime, thanks so much for watching the Silent Hill Marathon. Um, it is not easy to get four videos out in one month, especially ones this long. So I really appreciate you guys watching these videos. Thank you so much for watching. And of course, have yourselves a radical Halloween. Now, if you don't mind me, I'm going to go play Ty the Tasmanian Tiger 4. I'm gonna put a rain filter to make it look like it's raining, but I mean, if he doesn't look wet, it's not gonna work. Okay, so where am I throwing it? Right in his face? <laughs> you know what okay, what do you, what do we're you think? Pouring. We're gonna we're gonna pour water on you. <laughs> what? We're just pouring. <laughs> I'm taking my pants off. <laughs> okay, pants you can do that. Right. Get it on his face too. I baptize you. <laughs> <laughs> Dylan, get it on his face, on his face, I'm all over his it. face. <laughs> you suck at pouring water. <laughs> okay. Oh my god, I feel like I just took a bath.